New Testament. This one, uh, so this was the one that was that was published. There's a dedication in the front of this, and we'll study this when we look at this edition specifically. But there's a dedication in the front of this to Queen Elizabeth. Um, this one was done in 1560. The one we're going to be looking at today was just the New Testament, the 1557 New Testament. I don't have one of those. I've looked far and wide trying to find a free PDF on the internet, and I can't find one. And then I also have a 1599 Geneva Bible. And this one is, this particular edition is known as the Pilgrim Bible because the 1599 edition of the Geneva Bible was the one that the pilgrims brought with them uh, when they came over on the Mayflower. Um, you know, I, I've seen some claims um, in different places that they also had a King James with them, the pilgrims. Um, frankly, some of that I'm, I'm not sure if I buy it because I... I just don't know if I trust uh, some of the things that are said about that, but um, the, the, the Geneva Bible is an important Bible. This is the Bible of Shakespeare, so any, any biblical allusions or citations or quotations in Shakespeare's plays after a certain date, I can't remember the year, were all from the Geneva Bible. And so this is the Bible that was brought to the Jamestown settlement in Virginia when the Jamestown colony was established um, in Virginia. And then it's also obviously the Bible that was, as I said a moment ago, was brought by the pilgrims. So there's a lot of things to talk about in relationship to the Geneva Bible. And we're going to start by talking about the New Testament. So this, this full Bible, this 1560 full Bible, was preceded by... A, just a new, a standalone New Testament three years before in 1557. So we're going to be talking about this New Testament today and probably next week, and then we'll spend time looking at the uh, 1560 full Bible. So let's get into introduction there. <clears throat> so last week in Lesson 124, we looked at the fortunes of the English Bible between the publication of the Great Bible in 1539 and the Geneva New Testament in 1557. We accomplished this by looking at the following three time periods. So we looked at the English Bible first during the latter reign of Henry VIII from 1539 to 1547, the reign of Edward VI from 1547 to 1553, and then the reign of Bloody Mary from 1553 to 1558. So if you're doing the math or you're paying attention to the dates, this one that we're going to talk about today is from 1557. It's published from Geneva, Switzerland, the year before Mary dies. So this one is going to be done by the exiles of, uh, by English exiles who escape England at, uh, and take refuge in the, on the continent of Europe, and they are going to produce this New Testament in 1557. So during the reign of Bloody Mary, we observed that no Bibles were printed in England between 1553 and 1558 in the reign of Bloody Mary. Today, in Lesson 125, we will begin looking at the 1557 Geneva New Testament. One cannot adequately accomplish this, however, without saying a few more things about the reign of Bloody Mary. We have to understand why, why, are, why is this the Geneva Bible? Because the Geneva that we're talking about here is in Geneva, Switzerland, and it's weird that an, a major significant English translation would be coming from Geneva, Switzerland. So the first thing I want to cover with you is sort of the circumstances that put these folks in Geneva at this time uh, for this Bible to be produced from there uh, in 1557. So if you look at the next point on page one, further thoughts on the reign of Bloody Mary. In order to adequately understand how the Englishmen who produced the Geneva Bible in Geneva, Switzerland came to reside there, we need to look a bit, we need to look at a bit more concerning Bloody Mary. Recall that Mary I wanted to bring England back under the authority of the Pope. This also meant that all Protestants living in England would need to be dealt with from a Catholic perspective, right? So from a Catholic perspective, are these Protestants heretics and seditionists and also are they, do they view them as guilty of all manner of crimes, okay? So let's look at what it says here. They, English Protestants, all agreed that they had to leave England for sanctuary for the sanctuary of Europe where the Reformation could survive and grow. To stay would mean certain arrest and the choice of the hangman's noose or the executioner's fire. 
they knew they must be freed in order to worship and to write about the Reformation hope. The success of the English Reformation rested on these men and those who would follow. Their fears were well founded. As soon as the new queen was crowned, she instituted far-reaching anti-Protestant reforms. The ascension of the Catholic Queen Mary I to the throne of England in 1553 signaled a period of intense Protestant persecution. Mary, the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, uh, fervently embraced the Catholic faith of her mother and was determined to restore England to loyalty to the Pope. Her humiliation with the divorce of her parents in 1533 and the failed plot of John Dudley to give the throne to the great granddaughter of Henry the uh, Hen that should say Henry the Eighth, not Seventh, Henry the Eighth, Lady Jane Grey, further shaped Mary's attitude toward Protestants. So let me just pause there for a second. She comes to power with a massive chip on her shoulder. Okay, she feels like she was slighted by her father's divorce of her mother over the business with the Pope and all that stuff, all that political intrigue and whatnot. Um, she is a staunch Catholic. She is married to, her, her mother was the daughter of a, of a very powerful Catholic um, uh, emperor on the continent of Europe. So Mary comes to the throne with a chip on her shoulder, very staunchly Catholic and very anti-Protestant. And she's going to set forth to kind of make these guys pay to get even with them and, you know, all those sorts of, you know, all that sort of imagery that you might think about. That's the attitude she's ascending the throne with here, okay? Mary was not satisfied with reform results begun early in her reign, so she dismissed married clergy and attempted to restore Catholic dogma. So if you were a married clergy, you were, you were just dismissed because they're moving back to Catholicism here, whereas you know the clergy are not allowed to what? Mary, okay? Thomas uh, Cromwell's destruction of monasteries in the 1530s was so successful that Mary could do little to restore them. Totally frustrated, she began embracing more stringent measures. John Rogers, Thomas Cranmer, Hugh Latimer, and Nicholas Ridley were arrested in Mary's first year as queen. So these guys are basically arrested straight out of the gate. Okay, page two. John Rogers, responsible for the famous Matthew's Bible, 1537, was the first to suffer martyrdom under Mary, and that was in 1555. John Fox records the horrible deaths of Latimer and Ridley as they were burnt at the stake. Public reaction to Mary's chancellor and henchman Stephen uh, Gardiner's uh, inhumane burnings and beheadings of Protestants backfired. I uh, English indifference to Protestantism now turned into sympathy to its cause. Fox's uh, acts and monuments from 1576 popularized and perhaps over-dramatized the events under Mary. Her nearly 300 victims were uh, embedded into the national consciousness. So here's what's going on. She's trying to stamp these guys out. She kills over 300 of them during her short reign. Well, when she's making martyrs of them, is, is this going to cause the English populace to turn in favor toward, Cal toward Catholicism or to turn against it? So what she's essentially doing is taking a lot of folks who are probably pretty indifferent and turning them into now sympathizing with these people that are being you know, hanged and burnt at the stake. You guys following that? It will not come as a surprise that some of the greatest scholars and theologians in English history were among those fleeing their beloved homeland. Miles Coverdale, translator of the Coverdale Bible, and many English Protestant leaders fled England for Switzerland and Germany where they took refuge. Among the notable continental exiles were William Williams, William Whittingham, <clears throat> Anthony Gilby, uh, Christopher Goodman, Thomas Wood, Thomas Cole, John Bale, John Knox, who's very famous, um, John Bodley, William um, Kethy, I think, and John Fox. Almost immediately the exiles began writing books and pamphlets defending their reform convictions. From this group came the translators of the Geneva Bible. So this Geneva New Testament is going to be done in Geneva, Switzerland by these exiles by these folks that are fleeing England to the continent of Europe to escape the wrath of Mary the First. We simply 
cannot blame or credit Mary for the production of the Geneva Bible. Her active persecution of Protestants did provide the context that led to their freedom for public that led to the freedom for publication. Fleeing the co fleeing the continent, I think that should say fleeing to the continent, gave the reformers the opportunity to operate freely in a society that would tolerate academic and religious freedom. So this is the only option they have. I mean, if they stay in England, are they probably going to be executed? So they, they flee and they take refuge. I agree with Dr. Brake. Mary cannot be blamed or credited with the production of the Geneva Bible. She can, however, be credited with creating the conditions in England which caused these men to flee. Once in Europe, they were free to translate God's word afresh for their kinsmen. So that's what happened. Once free from the clutches of Bloody Mary, the need for a new English translation can largely be attributed to the issues, to issues related to cost, size, and readability, according to Dr. Brake. Quote, <coughs> the English Bibles previously published were large, cumbersome, and expensive. I mean, you think, think about these great Bibles, these Matthews Bibles. These are big Bibles, and, they, they, and because they're big, they cost, you know, more money. So let me start that over. The English Bibles previously published were large, cumbersome, and expensive. The awkward block letters, often called Old English or Gothic, and lack of verse divisions made imperative a new translation that would accommodate the growing reading public. So conditions in Geneva, Switzerland facilitated the production of such a volume in 1557. So before we go any further, does anybody have any questions or comments about the first point? I mean, there's, there's things going on here that like we don't even think anything about now in the 21st century, like the size, I mean, it, some, some I, I shouldn't say we think nothing about, but to us, it's, we, it's, it's not the same issue that it was for these folks, right? I mean, if you, are, if you have failing eyesight, can you go and buy a large print Bible? If you want a Bible with no margin, if you want a Bible with this or with that, I mean, can you get what you pretty much want within reason? That wasn't the way it was back then. So are there any other questions? So let's look at then the Geneva New Testament, 1557. That the next English translation of the Bible would originate in Geneva is befitting its history as a haven for printing the vernacular language Bibles of the Reformation. So as we're going to see in the next point, Geneva, Switzerland, a ton of Reformation era Bibles, vernacular translations. Everybody understands what I mean by the vernacular, right? Vernacular meaning the everyday language of the people. So if I'm in Spain, what's the vernacular? Spanish. If I'm in Italy, what's the vernacular? Italian. Okay. If I'm in Germany, obviously the vernacular is German. The year 1557 in the city of Geneva were both the time and the place for a new English translation. For 20 years, revisions of Olivetan's French New Testament had been published in Geneva, revised by Calvin and the Genevan ministers, the latest in 1556. Italian exiles there printed a revised Italian New Testament in 1555 on the way to a whole Bible. A revised New Testament in Spanish was printed there in 1556. So all that to say is does Geneva, Switzerland have a rich tradition of printing these Reformation era vernacular Bibles? be it in French, Spanish, Italian, and then ultimately the one we're looking at in English. Okay? Professor Daniel gives the most detailed account of the men responsible for the Geneva Bible and how they came to take refuge there. Dr. Daniel states the following in the Bible in English, its history and influence, quote, uh, I should say two months. Two months after Queen Mary's coronation in, on 19 July 1553, William Cecil, formerly Secretary of State, and he would be again famously under Elizabeth, began to put into operation a plan for the migration of British Protestants to the continent. This was supported by English merchants out of the Protestant belief, but also with an eye to future trade. The great movement of Protestants to the continent in January and February 1554 happened before the most serious persecution got underway. 
The first burning of John Rogers, maker of the Matthews Bible, took place on 4 February 1555. In the 18 months before that martyrdom, the migration had been carefully organized. So this is a systematic move organized to get these people out of England and safe on the continent. Okay? To settle in one of the continental cities of refuge, the migrants had to be religious refugees. That is, they had to be, in the modern phrase, asylum seekers fleeing persecution. The dangers in England were real. The restriction of Protestants began within a few days of Mary's ascension. In 1555, Calvin had welcomed into Geneva what might, uh, what one might call second stage English refugees. That, it is, that, is a, that is the groups formerly under John Knox in Frankfurt who had quarreled with the original settlers there over the need for Anglicanism to f reform further and the direction of the supreme authority being vested in the congregation as in Geneva under Calvin. The 46 English who moved to Geneva were given their own place of worship to be shared with the Italians and on 15 November, not November's, on 15 November, 1555, held their first service in their own language according to the rites of the Geneva, Geneva Reformed Church. One of them was William Whittingham. So they, they take refuge in different spots through some events and some, some disagreements that the refugees had amongst themselves. This one group ends up in Geneva, okay? And what they are disagreeing with each other over is whether or not Anglicanism needed to reform itself even more than it already had, right? So, I mean, imagine you have, in, in, in the English mind at this time, you had Catholic and you had Protestant, right? Or Catholic and Anglican. That's what you had. These guys all left England because they, want, they didn't want to be under who? They didn't want to be under the Pope. They didn't want to be under Mary the First, right? So now they get now they get to the continent, and amongst themselves they have a, a sort of a secondary disagreement now over whether or not Anglicanism needed to further what reform. And so some said yes, some said no. The ones that said yes end up in Geneva, Switzerland. When they get to Geneva, Switzerland, Calvin allow gives them access to a church building and they're allowed to have a church service in the English language in Geneva, Switzerland. So that's kind of the, the circumstances here that lead up to this. Does anybody have any questions about that? And uh, oh, by the way, if you weren't aware of it, I would be one of those people that think Anglicanism definitely needed to further reform, but that's a different topic. History is unclear as to, as to whom is due the credit for the Geneva New Testament. So if you look at this title page, nowhere on the title page or anywhere in the whole volume is anybody claiming responsibility for it. There is a note to the reader, which we'll talk about here in a minute, that's written in the first person. So whoever wrote it is saying, I this, I this, I that, talking about themselves and what they did. It is widely believed that William Whittingham is responsible for the 1557 Geneva New Testament. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. That said, Professor Daniel discusses a manuscript, Life, uh, uh, Life, on, it's just called Life, that's all it says. So, um, the only thing that should be in italics there is the word life. It's called Life on the Life of William Whittingham in Bodleian Library in Oxford that offers the best clues. Regarding this manuscript, Dr. Daniel states, quote, it tells of a group of learned men in Geneva meeting to pursue the existing English versions of the New Testament, thus making, as David Alexander pointed out, the first such revision committee in um, English Bible history, the learned men mentioned, so these are men that are mentioned in this, this document, Life, that are mentioned are Miles Coverdale, Christopher Goodman, and uh, uh, another Oxford man from um, Bracion, 
and then, uh, and then Christ Church, who had later become Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity, Anthony Gilby, Thomas Sampson from Oxford and Cambridge, who went on to be Dean of Christ Church Oxford. Uh, he had most recently uh, been close with Hebrew scholar Emmanuel Tremelius at Cambridge and Strasbourg, Dr. William Cole and William Whittingham himself. They were possibly joined in committee by John Knox and certainly later for the whole Bible by William uh, Keth. what? Ketha, John Barron, John uh, Pullian, John Bodley, and William or W. Williams. How much, so top page four, how much the learned men who were in Geneva contributed to the New Testament as opposed to the whole Bible that followed is unclear. There has been persistence in the statement, certainly implied in the preface, that one man, Whittingham, did it all alone. Now that's because of the I statements in the preface. I mean, if I wrote a book, I'm not going to say they did this and they did that, or we did this and we did that. I'm going to say what? I did it. So that evidence suggests that William Whittingham probably did this alone or was the one who was at least most responsible for it. We ultimately, though, we don't know. Not only does the 1557 New Testament itself, however, say nothing about that, the writer of the manuscript Life does not mention that he translated the New Testament. It seems a large item to omit. Perhaps assumption of a large share by Whittingham is safest. So let's just, what do we take from that? What, what we know is, is there a, a fairly high concentration of English scholars living in Geneva, Switzerland during these years? They are the refugees of the reign of Bloody Mary. Their names are listed out there in the manuscript. The preface, or the, the, the letter to the translators uses the, this, these I statements. So no one really knows for sure. Most people think that they're fairly safe in, in viewing Whittingham as kind of being the major player here in this project. So <coughs> we're never probably going to know for sure. We know more. We know much more about the whole Bible from 1560 than we do the New Testament from 1557. So there's a lot more documentation and things about the circumstances that led to this than there is the New Testament. Any questions? In, phys in terms of its physical features, such as size and font, to name but a few, the 1557 Geneva New Testament stood in stark contrast to the Great Bible and other earlier English Bibles for the following reasons. After the Great Bible of 1539, the next newly prepared English New Testament was printed in Geneva in June 1557. It, referring to the Geneva New Testament, marked both a great contrast to the Great Bible, and though at first it might not seem today, a long stride forward. So <clears throat> what he's saying there is, when we look back on it, we, we, maybe we missed some of this stuff, but there's, there's some pretty significant advances that are happening in terms of the formatting and presentation of the English Bible with this 1557 New Testament when compared to the previous one, the Great Bible in 1539. For one thing, it is small, an octavo for the hand or pocket, roughly the size of a prayer book in a church pew, as editions of the New Testament had been since Tyndall's and Coverdale's over 20 years before. So instead of being a great Bible, this massive monstrosity by the standard of the day, it's a small thing. So let me see if I can call up a couple other pictures. Um, I'll show you that one in a second. Here's a scale image of the size of the page compared to a hand. So it's very small. It's, it's, it's small enough that you could, you know, stash it somewhere, put it in a pocket. It, it's very small in size compared to um, the ones that had, that had gone before it. Okay, I'm going to go back to this. 
Um, so for one thing, it is, it is small in octavo for the hand or pocket. I already read that. Uh, next sentence. That made a contrast to Henry VIII's original huge folio great Bible or Matthew's before that. But the contrast was not only in the pleasing small size. It is also handsome for the first time an English Bible text was printed not in heavy Gothic black letter in Northern European, in Northern Europe by printers in Antwerp or London, but in Switzerland by Conrad uh, Battis. So that's his name right there. There's the printer, Conrad Battis, right here on the title page. Uh, the son of the master printer of Paris in a clean, clear Roman, a French style, also influenced by Italian printers, trained in the more refined humanist manner. Okay, so let's just look at this. So this is what this page looks like. This is from a 1557 Geneva Bible. Can you actually read that? You remember some of the things I put up here before had these massive chunky black letters that you could hardly even make out, okay? So this is an advancement here. Let me just show you another picture just of one page. So, let's see if I can, ah. Maybe I can't make that any bigger, but I, it should be sufficient. So it's a clean page, okay? It's very readable. It's very, the, the, so it's, it's not only an advancement in its size, you don't have to carry out around this huge massive clunky thing, but it's also an advancement as, as far as the formatting and the layout of the page and the font and stuff that's being used. Okay, so let's go back to the notes. <clears throat> and you can see some of this here. Its pages are uncluttered and the text ruled off with red lines. Now you can't see the lines here anymore, but you can see, is there a clear center column here that comprises the text, the biblical text, and then with the notes in the margin? Yeah. It's very readable, it's very clean, okay? So as pages are uncluttered, the text ruled off with red lines with wide margins at the top, or sorry, at the sides, top and bottom, giving an attractive sense of space. The paper shows signs of having been carefully selected. The neat notes, an average of two per page, are in the outer margin in Roman with occasional references in italics on the inside margin. So you see that here, right? So here's the main text. Here's some cross references and stuff over here in italics on the, what would be the left hand margin. And then over here on the right hand margin you have marginal notes like you would have in a modern study Bible. So. A relates to A. So you read this verse. Uh, this is from Matthew 20, Matthew, looks like Matthew 19. And it says, uh, and said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist. And then there's a note here to direct you to this note here about John the Baptist. Okay, very, very much formatted the way we would recognize. Is everybody following this? Uh, where am I at here? The thickest cluster of marginal notes accompanies the opening chapters of Matthew's Gospel. Some pages, even the epistle to the Romans, have no, no, no notes at all. Also for the first time, the text is divided into numbered verses following the Greek New Testament of Stephanus made in 1551. So this is a major issue. Notice, do you see for the first time verse numbers? So here's chapter 19, verse 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? Now, imagine going, imagine going to a church service. Imagine coming to our church and me preaching and you not having verse numbers in your Bible and having to just figure out what verse I was reading. That... I mean, that's going to be somewhat challenging, right? So this New Testament from 1557 is the first one to put in the verse numbers. And notice how they're all squared off along the margin. Okay? <coughs> Let's go back to the notes. So in, so in doing this, they're following the Greek text of Stephanus from 1551. 
Also for the first time in the 1557 New Testament, each verse starts a fresh line with its number, whether it is the beginning of a new sentence or not. This was again new for the first time outside Latin or Greek. Again, for the first time in an English Bible, words not in Greek, thought to be necessary additions for English clarity, are in italics. So, you know from reading a King James Bible, do you occasionally encounter a word in italics? Now, when you encounter a word in italics in a King James Bible, it's telling you, we put this word in here to complete the thought in what? In English, right? Well, that started with which Bible? This 1555, 1557 Geneva New Testament. Now, I don't think there's any italics on this page, except for this chapter heading here. But I don't, I don't think there's any uh, words in the text in italics, but you understand the idea of it. So all of these features are new to the English Bible with this New Testament printed in Geneva. The font, the spacing, the readability, the, num the verses being numbered and each verse starting on a new line, even if it wasn't the end of a sentence, very familiar formatting to what we are aware of. So, <clears throat> any questions about that? Yeah, bud. This seems like an incredible <coughs> responsibility uh, for Whittingham. And if he is the one who decided, because the meaning could be changed relative to where you put the number, you might you know, have two sentences. You mean where you put the numbered verse? Yeah, it could change the meaning relative to where you put the numbers. Yeah. And he was not inspired. No. Uh, so I'm just saying. So let's look at the next, let's look at the next point because it addresses your very point. Okay. Regarding the chapter division, that should say divisions, and verse numbers, Blackford Condon states the following in his 1882 work, The History of the English Bible. He says, quote, it has been quite common of late years to rail against the verse divisions of the Holy Scriptures. Doubtless the sense of the text has sometimes been interrupted by this artificial system, which is kind of what you were getting at, right, bud? Yes. It may possibly have given occasion also to the building of, quote, doctrinal systems upon isolated texts. Yet too often the practical benefits of easy reference and help to the memory and adaptation for reading and public have been overlooked. The division of chapter and verse have no biblical authority. Neither has that of the paragraph, neither has that of the comma, semicolon, or period in punctuation. Now I have an insertion here. I believe that the English punctuation is necessary for accurately conveying the sense in English. I mean, English is a language that requires punctuation, right? So it's artificial in the sense that there is no punctuation in the Greek. But when you're translating and you're lifting that out of Greek, out of the donor language, and you're rendering it into the receptor language in English in this case, you're going to have to have punctuation in English because that's the way English works. But the punctual and, and, and you know guys argue about this stuff. Even King James advocates they argue about you know the punctuation being inspired and stuff like that. Okay, I, 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 for me, I just understand a couple facts. Number one, there's no punctuation in the Greek. Okay, there there isn't. So, but number two, I understand that you have to punctuate a sentence in English to convey what it means. So I understand that punctuation is necessary, and thirdly, I understand that you want to have the most accurate punctuation possible so that folks understand what's going on. So let me read that uh, again. <clears throat> neither has that of the paragraph, neither that of the comma, semicolon, period, uh, or period in punctuation. So skipping the bracket now. They are all human invention, I think that should say inventions, and something of the same arguments produced against the former may uh, argue, should say argue, against the latter. The adoption, however, of paragraph and, of the, and at the same time retaining the chapters and the numberings of chapters and verses is doubtless the most desirable mode of printing the text of the Bible. 
So we could, that could be debated, and I, I understand. Like, I know guys, uh, I, I preach with guys who, are actually, who want to buy a Bible that doesn't have the verse numbers in it and just has paragraphs. Because they, they, kind of, they kind of think similarly to what Bud said, that sometimes these, these verse numbers, because they are artificial or arbitrary occasionally, could affect the sense as you study through a passage. Um, on the whole, I would say, though, that we're better off for having the numbering than not. Amen. That's, that's my opinion. Now, somebody else could obviously have a different opinion, but what we're saying here is this is the first Bible to do this. So we, the first English Bible to do this, right? Any other thoughts on that before we move on? Bud, did you have anything you want to add to that? No. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Even the title page was altogether, altogether different from the English Bibles that preceded it. So let's go back and look at that. Put that image back up of the title page. So that's this page right here. <coughs> Quote, the title page is another contrast to that of the Great Bible. Now, let's stop there for a minute. Do you remember the Great Bible that had the massive picture of Henry VIII sitting on the throne handing out the Bible? Remember that? The God in this upper corner, you know, blessing this event, and, and then the Bible's handed out. Remember we studied that image with the Great Bible? Is this very simple compared to that? It's very simple. The title page is another contrast to that of the Great Bible. Instead of announcing its authority by declaring it to be the result of the, quote, diligent study of diverse, excellent, learned men, experts in the tongues, it states, quote, the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ conferred diligently with the Greek and best approved translations, with arguments as well before the chapters as for every book and epistle. Also, um, diversities of readings and most profitable annotations of all hard places whereunto is added a copious table. That's all it says. So, let's go back to the other image just briefly. So, here's a brief chapter heading. Here are the notes. Here are other cross-references and other readings. And that's all the title page says. So you don't have this grandiose image of, you know, royal authority and all the stuff going on, okay? In other words, critical study is invited. Further, the title page does not announce absolute royal power, as in the Great Bible, in the later Bishop's Bible, and the first King James with massive uh, construct, um, constructions that block the entrance to the reader. It will be noticed that there are no names, unlike the central panel of the King James, where King James and Robert Barker are prominent. Here, inviting the reader in is a small, simple engraving in the middle of the page. It looks like the temptation of Eve would be what I would think is going on there. But that's it. Nothing ornate, nothing grandiose, just very simple. Here's the Bible in English. Here's what we did. We gave you some, we gave you some uh, he chapter headings, we gave you some marginal notes, and we gave you some cross-references. Have at it. The author or authors of the, of the prefactory matter found in the 1557 Geneva New Testament is difficult to discern. There are questions and debated, there are questions and, de I don't like that sentence. There are questions and debates regarding the degree, that's it. There are questions and debates regarding the degree to which John Calvin himself was involved in the Geneva New Testament. <laughs> Once again, we turn to Dr. David Daniel for a detailed discussion of this matter. Quote, not only is the whole work anonymous. So again, there's no, the only name on this thing is the name of the printer. The guy whose press it was printed on, that's it. Not only is the whole work anonymous, how much Kelvin associated himself with this New Testament, if he did at all, is also unclear. He apparently wrote an eight-page introductory epistle declaring, uh, declaring with good 
Epistle to the Romans, Epistle to the Romans force that Christ is the end of the law, an important endorsement of the new work. Yet, this epistle dedicatory is a translation of a piece written 20 years before and of his second published work, Calvin's preface in Latin to the New Testament in Olivetan's Bible of 1535, the first French Protestant Bible. And he was Calvin's cousin. Olivetan was Calvin's cousin. By 1557, the 1557 English translation of Calvin is well written, indeed lively, and has the distinction of introducing two words into the English language. One of them, good hap, meaning good fortune. OED cites this uh, location as the first, did not survive. The other, Borgias? Bourgeois. Bourgeois, that's a, kind of a French word, bourgeois. Uh, which OED does not cite before 1654, certainly did. So in other words, so let me explain what all that means. In this, there's a epistle dedicatory that is a translation of something Calvin wrote in another Bible. Now whether Calvin himself did it, or whether he ordered it to be put in there, or said, you know, you guys can't print this Bible here unless you put my preface into this, we have no idea, all right? But in doing it, these two words came into the English language from that. In the epistles, Calvin traces uh, the continuing providence of God uh, from the fall of man to his redemption through Christ Jesus. God has given two testimonies of nature everywhere and in all places and in all things he hath displayed in his ensigns yea so clearly bla blazed his arms that there was no such idiot which could pretend ignorance in not knowing so sovereign a lord so that's calvin's words all right and that's in so if we were to turn the page and unfortunately i don't have a picture of it but if we were to turn this page over there would be this Calvin epistle here that had that language in it that we just read, a, a, a translation of it. And the testimony of the law and the prophets establish an awareness in men of the confirmation of the old covenant uh, in the new through Christ. So, you know, there's some covenant theology stuff in there, which obviously isn't great, but understand... I mean, this happens in, in Calvin's Geneva, and, you know, we're not sure exactly to what degree Calvin was involved or not involved. We do know that there's an epistle dedicatory in this 1557 New Testament that was a translation of something Calvin had wrote for another Bible. Is everybody following all that? Also included in the prefactory material is an unsigned three-page address uh, to the reader that Dr. Daniel believes was written by Whittingham. Okay, so again, this is where we have these I statements. So whoever wrote this three-page epistle is definitely intimately involved with the project and is speaking about who? Himself. Himself. The unsigned three-page address, probably by Whittingham, to the reader, mercy and peace through Christ our Savior, echoes Tyndall's obedience of a Christian man in its awareness of opposition to the Bible and of Jesus' parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. It continues. So this is a quote. For this cause we see that in the church of Christ there are three kinds of men. Some are malicious despisers of the word and graces of God who turn all things into poison and a father hardening and a father hardening of the further should say I think we need to check that of their hearts others do not openly resist and condemn the gospel because they are uh, stroken as it were in a trance with the majesty thereof yet either they quarrel and ca and cavil or else deride and mock at whatsoever thing is done for the advancement of the same. The third sort are the simple lambs, which partly and already, which partly are already in the fold of Christ, and so hear willingly their shepherd's voice, and partly wandering astray by ignorance, tarry the time till the shepherd find them and bring them back unto his flock. To this kind of people 
is this translation, notice the word what? I chiefly had respect. So that statement sounds like it's coming from one person, does it not? So in other words, who's he writing to? He's writing to these simple lambs who just need to hear the voice of the shepherd. And how are they going to hear the voice of the shepherd? Through the word. And when they hear the voice of the shepherd, are they going to you know, come back to the fold and you know, all this sort of stuff is the, the language that's being used. So to this kind of people, is this translation, I, chief, I chiefly had respect as moved with zeal, counseled by the goodly, and drawn by occasion, both of the place where God had appointed us to dwell, and also of the store of heavenly learning and judgment, which so aboundeth in this city of Geneva, that justly it may be called the patron and mirror of true religion and godliness. I don't know about that. That's, I think there's a lot of things about Kelvin's Geneva I wouldn't particularly like myself, but anyway, that's what they said. The writer goes on to explain briefly his care with the Greek and with English phrasing, the division of verses and the italic insertions, italics insertions. He explains that he has uh, signaled variant Greek readings, especially the ones wi uh, which make significant changes. So again, quoting from this, moreover the diverse readings according to diver uh, diverse Greek copies which stand but in one word, may be known by this note, quote, if the books do state alter the sentence, then it is noted with this star. So what does that mean? That means is this Bible, whoops, is this Bible going to note variant Greek readings? Yes. No English Bible before that had did that. Okay? There are nine of these occurrences. Thus, the sentence uh, making Acts 14, 7 in Tyndall. So this is what Tyndall said. And there they preach the gospel, has become into 1557, preaching the gospel with now added to it from some Greek manuscripts, the words, insomuch that all the people were moved at the doctrine, so Paul and Barnabas remained in Lystra. So all that last part is found in the Geneva Bible, but it was not found in Tyndall. Okay? You guys following that? So why don't you just grab your King James quick and let's look at that verse. So we're looking at Acts 14.7. Acts 14.7. The King James says, and there they preach the gospel. The Geneva adds that whole what? That whole second sentence. In so much in so much that all the people moved at the doctrine, so both Paul and Barnabas remained in Lystra. So, why, why is the Geneva adding that? They're adding it because they are no, they're finding a variant reading in a Greek manuscript. Now, so all of this becomes very pertinent information when we start talking about the historical development of the English Bible. So Tyndall's read exactly the way the King James read, but this, 15, this 15, um, 1557 Geneva Bible adds that. Let's look at what they did in 15, while we're talking about this, let's look at what they did in 1560, just to compare. We well, we need chapter 14, right? Yes. Verse 7. It says, and there were preaching the gospel. And then in the margin, it adds the alternative reading. 
But the text has, the text of the, of the 1560 has it exactly the way the King James has it, but the alternative reading is added to the margin. It's right here in the margin, marked off by these lines. It's in the margin. So all interesting things to consider. I'm not prepared to delve into that whole topic right now. I'm just pointing out some factual things, okay? Any questions about that? Okay? This is the first time that an alternative Greek reading had been so clearly marked in the margin of an English Bible. This is no doubt indicative of the influence of Robert um, Estein, or Stephanus, is how most people refer to him as, who had taken refuge in Geneva in about 1550. In the same year, we need to fix this, Sylvia, it was not the same year, it was in the year 1551. In 1551, Stephanus published his first edition of the Textus Receptus, in which he noted some 350 variant Greek readings. This edition included the Greek text of Erasmus, along with the first critical apparatus, noting variant readings from about 16 Greek manuscripts, including the Complutensian Polyglot. So, why is the Geneva Bible including that as a variant reading? It's doing it because of the Greek text of Stephanus. So Stephanus is still the Textus Receptus, but he's noting in underneath the text where there are some different readings in the manuscripts. Now, I will say this. Remember, variants are only a problem if they differ substantively. Okay? Variants are only a problem if they differ substantively. If they are, if they are um, the same, if they are equivalent in meaning and substance, you could say, so think about it this way. Could I say at 10.30 I'm going to go to the store? Could I say that? Could I say at half past 10 I will go to the store? Is it, are those two statements substantively equivalent even though they are not verbatim, verbatimly identical with each other? Yes. Okay, so understand, variants are only a problem if and when they substantively differ. Okay? So top page seven. The author of this three-page address, possibly Whittingham, also addresses the completeness of the arguments found at the beginning of each book and chapter throughout the 1557 Geneva New Testament. Specifically, the author, um, specifically, the author addresses, bleh, the author of the address states, quote, I have endeavored so to profit all, what he means there is help everyone, thereby that both the learned and other will be holpen for my knowledge, I have omitted nothing unexpounded, whereby he that is exercised in the scriptures of God might justly complain of hardness. So what's he talking about? You see this stuff right here? So here it says chapter uh, 14. That's not chapter 19, that's chapter 14. And you see this stuff here in italics? That's the argument. That's his statement about what's in this chapter. Okay, I could show it to you a little bit more clearly in this. So here's the 1560. Here's talking about Romans. Okay, and do you see right here? It's got this thing that says the argument. So this is the preface to the book of Romans, right? And then if you go and then underneath that even smaller, it's got underneath chapter one, it has a smaller description about what's in chapter one. So in the notes here, when he's talking about the arguments, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about these chapter and book summaries that are at the beginning of every book and every chapter in this 1557 New Testament. Professor Daniel believes this statement applies to the arguments the summaries of the contents at the head of each book, 
Please recall that Coverdale and Matthew's Bible did similar things. That said, the book and chapter summaries found in the Geneva New Testament were fresh, i.e., they were not simply reprints of other earlier such material. They were all new. They didn't just like copy them from somebody else that did it before them. They, he, they made their own. The arguments found in the 1557 New Testament were reproduced in the 1560 Geneva Bible, and I just showed you that by showing you the page from the Book of Romans. Okay, So, in the next lesson, we'll look at the text, of the biblical text of this New Testament, and we'll be able to make some comparisons between the Geneva Bible with its predecessors as far as the way the verses read and the statement of the text. So, does anybody have any questions or comments about any of that? Arguments or commentary that was in the Bible. Yeah. Did they call it a summary, I think, right, of the chapter? Ernie? Did, did that um, uh, lean towards Calvinism because of the people involved? Most, most observers of the Geneva Bible are pretty keenly aware of the fact that a lot of it tends toward Calvinism and in some of the marginal notes, okay? Now, so the 1560 comes out obviously in 1560. There is a later edition where some of the notes, the marginal notes are rewritten to further enforce Calvinistic theology. So, but we have to acknowledge and recognize that there's di a slight diff there's differences between these two early ones, and even the notes that you would find in this one from 1559. Because between this and this, somebody rewrote and edited some of the marginal notes and some of these arguments to make them more Calvinistic. Okay, so that's why the Puritans in England. Think about the Puritans that came on the Mayflower and settled in North America. They were extremely Calvinistic. And they clung to this Bible. Because this Bible has in it Calvinistic doctrine and theology. Okay? So when King James is ascending the throne now in 1604, he hates the Geneva Bible because of the marginal notes. And he views the Geneva Bible as seditious and challenging the king's authority because King James was a believer in the divine right of kings. And the marginal notes in the Geneva Bible are critical of that doctrine and belief of divine right of kings. So King James wants the Geneva Bible to go bye-bye because he doesn't like it on account of the marginal notes. Okay, so all that, all of that is pl going to play in to the decision that he makes to issue a new translation in 1604. Okay, very political stuff going on. Okay, anything else before we pack up and quit? Bud, you look like you got something spinning up there. I just think it's amazing how God works in all uh, the kings. Reasoning was flawed, but God's purpose was. So, in, in, in 16, I'll just say this and then we'll quit. In 1604, there are two Bibles. This is the Bible of the English commoner, the Geneva Bible. The common man loved the Geneva Bible. The high church officials of the Anglican church loved the Bishop's Bible because it had been done by Anglican bishops. So when King James ascends the throne in 1604, he has a political problem on his hands as it relates to the Puritans and their Bible and the church and its Bible that he is going to endeavor to solve largely by agreeing to sanction what? This one. But again, as interesting as all that is, I can't tell you everything today or you won't come back. So, All right, I'm going to stop.